The first of five questions is simply, what is autism? We have five questions that should help anybody understand what autism is all about. All right, now, to get a definition of autism, we turn to autismspeaks.org, and here is how they define autism. Autism or Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, refers to a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. According to the Centers for Disease Control, autism affects an estimated 1 in 44 children in the United States. Now, we could take that a step further. And we could explain that, uh, you know, children grow up to be adults. So if it affects one in 44 children, then it also affects about one in 44 adults. Now, I've heard different statistics. Some people say it affects maybe one in 60 some, and others say, well, you know, it's not um, universally diagnosed. So there may be other people who have autism, and we just don't know it. Or then again, maybe some people are diagnosed who should not be. I doubt that, but it's something we ought to consider. Number two, what is it like having autism? Well, to answer that question, you might want to ask somebody who is autistic. Well, here I am. I'm autistic. I have Asperger's syndrome, which is high-functioning autism. And uh, I've had this condition Going on 70 years, I mean my entire life. So, uh, uh, by the way, everyone has, or I should say, everyone who has autism, they always have it. Once you got it, you got it. You're born with it. All right, so what's it like? Um, well, imagine that you are eight feet tall and you're trying to live in a typical world. You find it... Uh, a bit difficult to walk into a room because there are very few doors that are eight feet tall. So you got to duck down every time you walk in, but then again, you got very broad shoulders. So it's kind of hard to fit. Well, that describes autism. It's hard to fit in a neurotypical world. So there are things, you know, if you're eight feet tall, there are things you got to watch out for, like trying to fit in a, a seat in an airline passenger, a uh, uh, passenger airline, uh, airplane rather, trying to, uh, sit in a car can you imagine that you'd have to have everything custom made that's kind of what it's like to live in a neurotypical world virtually everything it seems is designed for neurotypical people so you live in a world that's just not cut out for you i mean sometimes literally not cut out for you the door is not cut high enough the automobile is not manufactured wide enough the, the roof of the car is not high enough, and so forth and so on. Another way I like to describe this is imagine taking a bucket of water and dropping um, oil, just a drop of oil, in the water. Now, it's in the water, but it doesn't mix with it. That's what it's like having Asperger's syndrome or autism. You are in society, but you don't mix. You're surrounded by neurotypical people, but uh, you're not part of them. You're in them, but you're not a part of them. Number three is you are limited in some areas, but excel in others. I didn't frame this as a question, just as a statement. But there's some areas like socializing the people with Asperger's syndrome and autism. They just, uh, they just can't do it. You know, things like socializing. The other day I was in a um, store what do you call those things, like dollar stores, dollar general, whatever. And I just wanted to say something to the uh, clerk there, and I found when I tried to talk, it just wouldn't come out. And if it did come out, I knew that it would sound strange, and the guy would think, ah, this guy's weird. That's something that we face all the time. Very difficult to make small talk. Now, sometimes our minds, at least my mind, is uh, in order or is in order with neurotypical people, and it's very easy to make small talk. But uh, I would say most of the time, that is not the case. So when it comes to groups, we are psychologically, we're just locked out. We don't understand it. 
And this goes, uh, my earliest memories of being around other children, you know, kindergarten, first grade. And you see the other kids on the playground at the school, and nobody teaches them to play together. They just do it. Nobody teaches them to socialize and hang out with each other. They just do it. It's innate. They just naturally do it. Except for me, I didn't know how to do it. Whatever it is in their mind that uh, allows them to interconnect and play with each other and even fight with each other. It's not in my brain, just not there. So uh, how, do you, how do you describe that? Well, I want you to imagine, trying to get you to have a point of reference, I want you to imagine that uh, you are maybe, I don't know, five years old and your parents decide to move to Russia and you're sent to school. And nobody speaks English but you, and you don't speak Russian. So you go out on the playground. Yeah, what do you do? I mean, you don't know the games. You don't know the kids. You can't communicate. Uh, you're just kind of, uh, well, you're just locked out. Now, with autism, with Asperger's syndrome, I think it's even a little more severe than that because even if you don't speak the language, you can still play with kids. But uh, with Asperger's syndrome, not only are you not mentally adapted to what other people are thinking, but they notice that. They pick up on it. It's like they have vibes, uh, like they have some kind of a radar reception or something that um, they just don't pick up that you have the vibes that they have, so they stay away from you or they push you away from them. That is what uh, some people describe as, you know, kind of like a zombie syndrome that uh, we live in the uncanny valley where it's like, kind of like we're robots that are almost human, but not quite. So we are limited in social areas, but the good news is we excel in other areas. People with Asperger's syndrome and autism tend to be more organized. They tend to um, be more creative in some areas. They also tend to contribute a lot to society in doing research and coming up with uh, innovative ideas and inventions. So uh, to kind of put this in perspective, uh, yesterday I was out taking my walk. And by the way, I do that routine, routinely rather almost every day. When, when the weather's fine permitting and when um, I'm physically capable of doing it. So I was out yesterday taking my walk and this kid, I don't know, what was he, nine years old? I've seen him around, talked to him before in the neighborhood and he just walked up to me to let me know that uh, he didn't think I was weird. Where did, where did that come from? I mean, just out of the blue. Oh, uh, by the way, I don't think you're weird. Well, apparently he's heard it from other kids or maybe the neighbors, I don't know. This guy is a little bit weird. Well, I'm 70 years old. I've, you know, experienced this time and time again. That's why I do these videos, by the way, is wherever you are in life, a child, teenager, young adult, older adult, wherever, I've been there. I may have not have had, I may not have had the exact experiences that you've had, but uh, I've been through that stage of life. So it's not shocking to me anymore for people to think um, I'm a little weird. I guess I am. Um, I don't know what else you call it besides space alien or Asperger's syndrome. Number four is this. What should typical people, that is um, neurotypical people, what should they know about people with Asperger's syndrome? One of the things that I have faced throughout my life is a condescending attitude among neurotypical people because they almost instantly recognize there's something wrong with you. Not always. Sometimes it may take them a minute or two to figure it out. Sometimes they may need a cue from someone else who figured it out. But uh, eventually, everybody in your immediate environment has got it. This guy's weird. This guy's a little strange. And they become very condescending. They become very uh, sometimes patronizing, but sometimes... It goes way beyond that, particularly with kids. They can be uh, mean. They can be bullied. Now, I wasn't physically bullied much as a kid, but uh, I was more just ostracized or just ignored. But a lot of kids with um, Asperger's syndrome and autism are physically bullied. I mean, they, what they have to go through is unbelievable. It's just abuse. 
they should not, in my opinion, they should not be required to go to school with neurotypical kids because, you know, they're being abused and they're children. That makes it child abuse. And it's being permitted and encouraged and facilitated by adults who should know better, but they don't. And it's very easy to talk down to uh, people with Asperger's syndrome. But even as an adult, I have found time and time again that other adults like to bully me because they think uh, I'm an easy target, I guess. I don't know why they do it. They don't do it to other people, at least not the way that they do it to me. But people like to bully others because I guess it gives them a sense of self-esteem. I don't know why they do it, but that's my best guess. And if you have Asperger's syndrome and you don't quite fit in and you don't communicate well socially... You're an easy target, and they know that, and they will often, I mean, often take advantage of you. So they hate you just simply because hey, you're weird. So what do you do? Well, what I find that I got to do is stay away from people best I can. Like, you can't do that all the time. And when I'm around people, I try to be accommodating. You know, like I told you the story when I was in the store trying to talk to the clerk. I really wanted to talk to that guy just to be courteous, but it wouldn't come out. And if it did come out, it sounded strange. And he would know by the tone of my voice that, eh, this guy's weird. It's also important to notice that sometimes because people with Asperger's syndrome and autism don't communicate, they find it uncomfortable to communicate, they come across as being aloof or even proud or arrogant. That is a misjudgment. We have a fifth question for you, and that is, can it be cured? Well, no, nah, it can be accommodated, but it can't be cured. Think of, uh, think of uh, autism or Asperger syndrome as mind blindness. Just can't see. I mean, it's like being born without eyes. You physically can't see. And whatever, whatever um, biological hardware is needed to give you eyesight is just not there either. It's not just you're missing eyes, but it, you can't. It can't be connected. But what you can do is you can facilitate people who are physically blind. People born without eyes and without the ability to see. And you can also facilitate people who are mind blind. That is people with autism and uh, Asperger's syndrome and some other conditions. But the difficulty is, even though they tend to pick up on our failures almost immediately, that empathy and sympathy that we would normally have for people who are physically blind, don't have eyesight, doesn't apply to people who are autistic. They don't feel sorry for us. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but uh, people tend to be more sympathetic and empathetic to people who are blind than people who are deaf. People who are deaf or, or can't hear well, we tend to be extremely impatient with those people. You know, I told you that once. Are you paying attention? You're listening? That's the way we approach people who have a hard time hearing. We become very frustrated with them, but not so much with people who are blind. We feel sorry for them. Well, people with autism and Asperger's syndrome, people just, they can't tell that we have uh, that particular um, condition. They just know we're weird. You know, that's, that's not a clinical term, but that's, you know, they're, you're just odd. There's something wrong with you. So uh, that is kind of, uh, what's the term? A turn off. People just don't like us. And uh, there are exceptions to that, but by and large, they would prefer that you get away from them. Or if not, they would prefer to get away from you. So you are typically ostracized. Now, some people say that uh, the reason people are autistic or have Asperger's syndrome is because of DNA, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. There are physiological prenatal conditions that um, seem to contribute to uh, autism. And we know that because instances of these conditions tend to correlate with um autism with Asperger's syndrome. Now, we all know that correlation is not the same as causation, but when they're there together, I mean, one is probably causing the other. So uh, it's likely that those physical conditions, if not causing autism, contribute to it. 
Do you see those two rectangles on the screen? If you like what you hear, want to hear some more, well, let's keep the conversation going. All you got to do is click on one of those two rectangles, and we'll, uh, we'll just keep on talking together. But if not, thanks for stopping by, and see you guys next time.